If you have your Bibles, please turn to the book of John, chapter 17. After saying all these things, Jesus looked up to, the hev to heaven and said, Father, the hour has come. Glorify your Son so he can give glory back to you. For you have given him authority over everyone. He gives eternal life to each one you have given him. And this is the way to have eternal life, to know you, the only true God, and Jesus Christ, the one who sent to earth, the one you sent to earth. I, I brought glory to you here on earth by completing the work you have gave me to do. Now, Father, bring me into the, into the glory we shared before the world began. I have revealed your name to the men you gave me from the world. They were yours. You gave them to me, and they have kept your word. Now they know that all things you have given to me are from you, because the words that you gave me I have given them. They have received them and have known for certain that I came from you. They have believed that you sent me. I pray for them. I am not praying for the world, but for those you have given me, because they are yours. All my things are yours, and yours are mine, and I have been glorified in them. I am no longer in the world, but they are in the world, and I am coming to you. Holy Father, protect them by your name that you have given me, so that they may be one as we are one. While I was with them, I protected them and kept them safe by that I am by that name you gave me. None has been lost except the one doomed to destruction, so that scripture would be fulfilled. I am coming to you now, but I say these things while I am still in the world, so that they may have the full measure of my joy within them i get i have given them your word and the world has hated them for they are not of the world any more than i am of the world my prayer is not that you take them out of the world but that you protect them from the evil one they are not of the world even as i am not of it sanctify sanctify them by the truth your world or your word is truth as you sent me into the world I have sent them into the world for them I sanctify myself that they too may be true truly sanctified my prayer is not for them alone I pray also for those who will believe in me through their message, that all of them may be the one, or may be one, Father, just as you are in me, and I am in you. May they also be in us, so that the world may believe that you have sent me. I have given them the glory that you gave me, that they may be one as we are one. I in them, and you in me, so that they may be brought to complete unity. Then the world will know that you sent me, and have loved them, even as you have loved me. Father, I want those, who have, those you have given me to be with me where I am and to see my glory, the glory you have given me because you loved me before the creation of the world. Righteous Father, through the world does not know you. I know you, and they know that you have sent me. I have made you known to them and will continue to make you known in order that the love you have for me may be in them and that I myself may be in them. I really believe in my heart that God is calling us to um, grow in our relationship with him. I believe this is a chapter on discipleship, all right? It's a chapter on discipleship. You may be asking yourself, what does discipleship mean? Well, it's the process of becoming a disciple. And disciple means, it, the word in Greek is mathetes. It means to be a learner or to follow one, a master, a, a, um, one who has called us to learn all of his ways or her ways. And so we are disciples. We're those that are in training. I got a nephew. He's an apprentice in the field of uh, the, um, um, electrical work. And so he is just coming up from the bottom. He's been doing it for about a year now. He's been sticking with it. And um, the family's actually starting to lean on him and call him to come and do little jobs. He's like, yeah, I think I could do that one on my own. I mean, he's a learner. There's a whole lot of things that he's still watching his stepdad doing as he, as he instructs him and shows him the way. And shows him, hey, don't touch these two wires right here or else you'll lose all your hair. 
we were giving him a hard time the other day. He goes, man, it's cool. I'm learning, but now I got to go and get certified. I go, go ahead, dude. Jump on it. He goes, if you hear of any of the schools that are reasonable, let me know. I said, hey, man, I'll keep my eyes open. I'm sure he'll find something before I find something for him. But be- becoming a follower and becoming um, one who is, is actually coming after Jesus, he models for us in this, this, this high priestly prayer. There are three movements in this chapter. I don't know if you caught them, but in the first few verses, verses 1 through 3, we actually see that Jesus goes to the Father and he says, The time has come that, that um, I might glorify you. He says, but I need your help, Jesus says in, in, in other words. He goes, I need you to help me. Jesus is expressing a deep concern that he has not only for himself because of what he's about to go through, but also for his own disciples and everybody else that he gave the word to. Okay? So this first portion of Scripture in chapter 17, Jesus actually goes to the Father and prays for himself. He prays for himself. Not the kind of prayer like, oh God, would you uh, kind of give me a parking spot? Although we know that's, that's cool too. Hey, if you want to pray for a parking spot, pray for a parking spot. I bet God will give it to you. But Jesus doesn't have some kind of selfish prayer like, you know, like I used to do in baseball. Like, God, would you just help me get three hits today, God, and I'll be a happy camper. And I'll know that you're with me. And if you give me three hits, I'll be a better Christian tomorrow. I mean, that's not the kind of prayer that Jesus is praying. But Jesus does not neglect the importance of praying for himself. Now, for some of us, that's kind of an interesting thing. Some of us would actually rather just pray for other people. Some of us, we're kind of not comfortable with the idea of praying for ourselves or asking for things when it comes to us. But look what Jesus says right here in verses 1 through 5. Look what it says. Father, the time has come. First of all, we we see right there that Jesus is marking a, a um, a very particular moment in his life that has been talked about, that has been hashed over and over, that he has been preparing his disciples for. He knows that the time has come, all right, where he is, he's about to go to the cross. He's about to give his life, all right? He knows that he is going to need strength. He's going to need encouragement. He's going to need um, a double dose of the power of God to go through what he's about to experience. So he needs the Father. He says, for you granted me authority over all people, that he might give eternal life to all those you've given him. Now this is eternal life, that they know you, the only true God and Jesus Christ whom you have sent. I've brought you glory on earth. He's talking to the Father. By completing the work you've given me to do. And now, Father, glorify me in your presence with the glory I had with you before the world began. Jesus says, glorify me. Glorify me. Glorify yourself in me. He's going to get to that in a little bit. That's the first movement. Jesus prays for himself. Somebody say, Jesus... Praise for himself. The second movement of this chapter is in verses 6 all the way until about 19, where it says Jesus prays for his disciples. The very 12 disciples um, that Jesus called to, to follow him, that he might pour everything that he, that he had to give them into them. He prays for them earnestly, a very sincere prayer. He's like, God, don't let them forget everything that I've taught them. Protect them. You gave them to me out of the world. He even, watch this, this is amazing how much Jesus believes in his disciples. He said, they are as much of the world as I am of the world. In other words, because they've put their faith and trust in me and followed me and have believed my word, they are just as much made righteous and belong to you, Father, as I do. Isn't that amazing? Isn't that awesome? So Jesus prays for himself. Then he prays for his disciples. And then the third movement of chapter 17 begins in verse 20. And he says, my prayer is not for them alone. 
I pray also for those who will believe in me through their message. So who's he praying for now? Us. He's praying for us. Isn't that awesome? I see this as, uh, um, if I were to illustrate it, some concentric circles where Jesus would be the, the nucleus would be right there in the middle. And then the disciples, would, oh man, that means making me blind. And then the next circle, the next ring would be his disciples that are a part of that inner circle, right? And then there would be another circle of those that are, are just, you know, one degree removed from his disciples. And then, of course, there we are mixed into all those, you know, concentric rings right there moving all the way outward. So here Jesus begins in chapter 17, focusing on himself. I'd like to just share a quick story. About 10 years ago, you know, I was married for, you know, about three or four years. Um, so I was new at that. My wife and I were about to have our first son. So I was about to be new at that, be a new daddy. I was still relatively new in the ministry, about three or four years in the ministry. I was really new at that. I'd always, you know, had this idea of what serving God meant, serving Jesus meant, is, was like, man, always putting others first. How many of you put others first? Isn't that wrong with that? How many of you put others first? If you don't put others first, it's kind of a, it's kind of a good thing to want to learn and, and to, to work at. But when it comes to the spiritual things, the calling that God has on your life, the people that God may be calling you to, the things that God may be calling you to, spiritually speaking. How many of you know that we can barely help others along if we ourselves are not where God needs us to be? How many of us have overlooked our own spiritual needs to care for the needs of others, and then down the road we look back and realize, man, I've been neglecting my own spiritual life. Oftentimes as a pastor, we're, all, we're always reminded of, of, of constantly giving, 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 pouring out, pouring out, pouring out. Mothers, you guys know this better than anybody. You're constantly taking care of everybody else's needs that oftentimes we neglect the very needs that we have. And I don't just mean physical, family needs. I don't just mean, you know, making sure everybody's fed and, you know, all the things that, that mothers take care of within the economy of the home. But I'm also talking about the things of the spirit. How many times do, do mothers come to a place where they say, man, I am spiritually empty. I'm dry. I have nothing to give. Right? Right? Well, it's because we never allowed ourselves or afforded ourselves the time to allow Jesus to come into our heart, to come into our life, to be fed, to feed ourselves, to get into God's word on our own, to make time to pray, to make time to, to receive God's word, right? To make time to go and just be able to sit in a Bible study and just serve, 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 serve. But some of us are workaholics, right? Some of us, we have to be busy or we're not serving God, right? Or we have to be doing this or we're not doing what we're supposed to do. But Jesus is showing us right here that not only is he in dire need of going to the Father and, show, and saying, Father God, now I'm trusting in you to show me the way that you'll be with me, that I'm going to entrust the word to my my crew, and, and I'm, looking, I'm looking to just kind of have a little vote of confidence from you, Father God, knowing that the things that I give to the disciples, that they're going to be able to go and move this forward into the world. So Jesus is going through all of this, but he, he takes the time to go to the Father and he prays for himself. Have any of you ever anointed yourselves with oil? I love it. It's a practice. My sister-in-law, who lives in Hawaii, she does it all the time. She takes a little olive oil, and most of the time when, 
when we're anointed, it's usually when somebody else, a pastor, somebody anoints your head with oil, prays over you, all right? And we need a blessing, you know, and we need somebody just to lay hands and just anoint us with oil, like as Scripture teaches us to do. We need a physical healing, anoint me, just pray for me, put some of that anointing oil right here, Lord, right here. Put that Holy Spirit all over me, God, right? My sister-in-law, she'll anoint her own head with oil, she's just like, Lord. I need, your, I need your blessing. I need your prayer. I need your, your favor. And a lot of what we see Jesus doing right here is called intercessory prayer. So if I were to give tonight's, you know, message a title, I would probably call it the lost art of intercessory prayer. Reminding us that we don't just start by jumping in the middle, interceding for somebody else, but we also need to intercede on our own behalf. We also have to make sure that you are spiritually fit. That you're being spiritually lifted up and poured into. That you have what you need to go forward. Jesus is modeling for us what that looks like. So... About three, four years into, our, my, into marriage and into becoming a dad and ministry and all these things. I had this thing in my mind that like, I had to be busy like every night of the week. I had to be constantly giving, 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 giving. I was new at marriage. And a friend of mine who was mentoring me, a good friend of mine, he says, Josh, we're sitting at Starbucks. And he says, do you ever just pray for yourself? I said, well, yeah, you know, God help me do this. God help me do that and all these kinds of things. He said, do you ever take time to just care for your, your spiritual needs? Do you ever take a retreat and step away from everything that you're doing and just allow God to just speak into your life? I go, I don't do it. I don't do it as often as I should. And he says, he goes, man, Early on in my marriage, I learned that if I don't take care of, of me, he says, I have nothing to give to my wife. He goes, and if I have nothing to give to my wife, it's a trickle-down effect. My kids ended up feeling, you know, experiencing the, the brunt of everything that's going on in my own personal life. You know, with the teenager, one of the things that we do as pastors, it's kind of a litmus test to see how a kid's doing spiritually. We, pops always ask them, how are your grades? Because you always know what's going on in somebody's heart because it's, there's a reflection. There's, there's, there's an imprint. There's, there's signs all over someone's face or people's lives of things going awry, things not being okay, things being out of order, right? It's the same way with our own spiritual lives. If our spiritual lives are out of order, are not centered in Christ or in God's word. Guess what? Our relationships are going to be out of order. Our relationships are going to suffer. Our relationships will not be able to take on their full potential that God wants them to take on. And where I started is where I want to come back to. I believe this chapter is all about discipleship. I believe God wants to make us in this church, disciples, followers of Jesus. Followers of Jesus. One of my, my buddy Mike said, so Josh, um, what are your more pressing needs when it comes to things of family in your own life? I go, man, I think about the kids a lot. He says, that's good. He said, but don't let the needs that your children have supersede the needs that your wife has. I was like, whoa, what do you mean? He goes, your first ministry is to your, your wife. I would say that to the men here. I'd say your first ministry is to your wife, not your children, if you're married and in that, that, that bond, that covenant of marriage. To the wives, your first line of service is to your, your husband. Because when mom and dad care for one another, guess what? The kids experience the overflow, the abundance of all that love and all that goodness and all that blessing. 
There's a, there's a ripple effect. Do you guys understand what I'm saying? If you allow God to minister to your heart, if you're spiritually healthy, if you're allowing God to weed out, to prune the things in our own lives that don't need to be there, Jesus says, Father God, I'm coming to you right now. Help me deal with me. Help me to trust and have the faith that, God, you got this, that you're in control, and that I don't have to worry about a thing. And you know what? Sometimes we can't even get to the place where we can put trust and put all the things in God's hands because guess what? We're worried about how jacked up we are. We're worried about all the things that we're dealing with and struggling with in our own lives. So spiritually speaking, I'm encouraging us today. Allow God to deal with you in your heart. Allow God to, to deal with you in your own heart. Go to God. Pray for yourself. Ask God to make you spiritually whole. Ask God to make you spiritually clean. Ask God to come in. Strengthen us from our inner being, our inner man, our inner woman. And see if the relationships in your life don't all become better right away right away because when we start dealing with ourselves and allowing god to deal with ourselves the way jesus allowed the father to deal with him guess what when we start doing that we become less defensive things be, start to make a lot more sense we become more humble we don't have to bark back we don't have to yell back we don't have to fight god's in control God's going to order all of our steps, and he's going to put all of our relationships into the places where they need to be. My friend Mike said, and then once you allow the Lord to deal with yourself, you allow the Lord to deal with your spouse or your family, your closest loved ones, and then the children, close family and friends. He says, but you know what? You have to build a hedge of protection around those concentric circles because the enemy comes and tries to attack he comes and tries to take your attention and your focus off of what you're doing for him tries to get you to get caught up tries to get us to stumble back into the things that were getting us caught up as individuals not allowing us to be the followers of christ that jesus wants us to be Let's not forget, Jesus has already prayed for us. He's given us his word. It's our job to follow. It's our job to come after him. It's our job to obey God's word. We got to build a hedge of protection, a hedge around our lives, around the lives of our closest loved ones, and say, Satan, we're in here. You stay out there. We're in here with Jesus. You're out there. You're out in the cold. You stay out there. You got no business being over here on this side of this hedge. You come on this side, I'm calling the cops. I'm calling the big man who calls the shots. But Satan doesn't want us to know that. Satan doesn't want us to read chapter 17. Satan doesn't want us to learn about intercessory prayer. Satan doesn't want us to learn about the high priestly prayer, this prayer that Jesus offers in the order of Melchizedek, the most high priest that's talked about in the book of Genesis that Abraham goes to and has an encounter with and offers his tithes that the book of Hebrews mentions. But uh -uh. Jesus left us this word right here so that we might become the disciples that we are meant to become. You want to know when, when we're really becoming a disciple? Is when we start making disciples. Do you know that? If after the first concentric circle, the first nucleus, which is us, us and Jesus, it's not just you, it's you and him. 
You know, after that circle right there, and it, the, then the, you have those other concentric circles that I'm trying to illustrate. Don't look at that. You'll go blind. <laughs> Guess what? If there are no other concentric circles that God is using you to disciple, then we're not becoming a disciple. Does that make any sense? Be becoming a disciple doesn't mean that we keep all of that good stuff, God's word, his grace, his mercy, the Holy Spirit, truth, power, grace, love, mercy, all that stuff to ourselves, but that we put it into motion. <clears throat> Next, I'm going to come back to this idea um, that we began with, verses 1 through 5, Jesus going to the Father, praying for himself. Jesus goes to the Father and says, Now glorify your Son, that your Son might glorify you. I'd like to encourage us to apply that to our own lives. We're now going to, to the Father, and we're saying, Lord, would you glorify us through who you are, and by virtue of Christ being in us. In other words, help us to glorify God who is in our lives. How do we do that? How do we glorify God with our lives? Right? One of the greatest ways that we do this is, and demonstrate this is through relationships, right? Is through Understanding who God has made us to be and becoming that. I had a great conversation with one of the young brothers from church today. He's been a part of this church for about 13, 14 years. And I go, bro, you have really changed. He said, really? I go, yeah. I go, your whole spirit is different. You've grown so much spiritually. And I said, if you, if you will allow. I said, I have a word from the Lord for you. And he's like, what is it? What is it? I said, God is getting ready to put greater responsibility on your lap because of the, the life of following Christ that you're demonstrating and that is visible in your own life. It was beautiful. It was just like, boom. It was a, a, a God moment. It was a God moment where all of a sudden I go, man, you have changed so much. He says, thanks, Pastor Josh. I go, nah, man, I'm just telling the truth. Amen? How many of us have ever come to that point in our lives when others have recognized those changes, those things that are taking place in, a, in us? It's beautiful when other people recognize that in us instead of us going, hey, you know, what do you think? Have I changed? Jesus is going to the Father. He's asking for strength that he might glorify him. We need to ask for strength. We need to have the, the ability to, to have the, the godly confidence to say, okay, Lord, I don't ex exactly know what this looks like, but I'm going to trust you, and I'm going to do what I, what I think you would want me to do right here in this situation. That's what Jesus is saying. He said, give, give me the strength. Allow me to do this, Lord. The second movement. Jesus prays for his disciples. Number one, verse eight. That they may hold on to God's word that Christ gave to them. It says, for I gave them the words you gave me and they accepted them. They knew with certainty that I came from you and they believed that you sent me. Period. Period. Jesus prays for his disciples that they will hold on to the word that he gave to them. Could that be a prayer of ours? Amen. A prayer not only that we will hold on to God's word, but a prayer that the word that God is using us to impart into those that God is using, um, using us to minister to, 
would also hold on to that word. Isn't it one of the greatest concerns of a parent when their, their child turns 18 and they're about to either leave home, go to college, be on their own? Oh, man, are they going to serve God the way we taught them? They're going to be on their own. Are they going to make wise decisions? I hope nothing happens to them. Sometimes that's one of the greatest um, lessons that God teaches some of us who are parents um, is when we're able to finally entrust the good work that God has done in us into the hands of God. Right? That's hard for a parent. That's hard for a mother to, to, to uh, swallow that pill about her baby boy, her baby girl. For a father, for his baby girl, oh my goodness, Lola is going to be 18 and be, leave my home one day. I hope some of you are there to help me. I'm going to have to send my baby girl away one day. And I'm going to have to trust that she's in God's hands. Jesus is saying the same thing. Father God, this is hard. I'm giving them to you, but would you please send your Holy Spirit quickly. Help them keep your word, your word that I gave to them. May they protect it. May they watch it. May they preserve it. May they use it. May they do it. May they put your word into action. Amen. That's when we can preserve it, protect it, keep it, is when we do it. Amen? When we, put, we learn those object lessons is when God's word becomes real in our lives. We got to take it from just being theory and now putting it into practice. Jesus had to do the same thing with his disciples. Verse 11b, beginning with Holy Father. Holy Father, protect them by the power of your name. The name that you gave me so that they may be one as we are one. Oh, the precious name of Jesus. Oh, God's name. May we remain in God's name. May we be attached to the name of God. May when the angels sing one day in heaven, and we're there with them, and they're singing, and we're singing too, guess what? And we're calling on the precious name of Jesus. May our being, may, may our spiritual being, be affixed, tethered to, connected to, grafted into, covered, I don't care, dragged along just as long as I'm there, somehow related to God's name. Amen. That God would keep us in his name, in who he is, in what he has done. Amen? What a blessing that is to know that Jesus is praying for was praying for his disciples, and he's praying for us the same way. Verse 17 through 19. Sanctify them by the truth. Your word is truth. As you sent me into the world, I have sent them into the world. For them I sanctify myself, that they too may be truly sanctified. I believe there's this whole process of sanctification, of God making us into the Josh that he wants, the you that he wants. He's sanctifying us. He's cleansing us. I believe there are three ways. I'm just going to share three ways that I believe God and Jesus was talking about right here when he says, now sanctify them. I believe one of the first ways was obviously we, we talked about it through God's word, that God would sanctify, that he would wash his disciples, their minds, their lives, everything about them, that they would be washed by the word of God. Amen. How many of you want your lives washed by God's word? I know I do. Give God a hand clap. Come on, y'all. The next way I believe Jesus is talking about, he says, sanctify them. I believe he, he sanctifies us through the Holy Spirit. I believe the Lord uses the Holy Spirit to sanctify us, to bring us closer to him. More focused on a, a, a purpose, a greater purpose. In the book of Joshua God told Joshua to go now to the people and tell them to sanctify themselves, which meant that they had to do a fast and a cleanse, which means that they had to eliminate anything that was a distraction between them and God. And the reason for it was so that they could put all of their attention, all of their focus on God and on God's work and on what God wanted to do through them. 
and so that they could focus, focus on the promise that God had given to them so that they could unite as a body with that one mission and purpose in mind, which is to go and conquer that land and to take it and call it their own. Sometimes we're not able to go and conquer. We're not able to go and, 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 and retrieve the promises that God has for us because we're distracted by life. We're distracted by our own problems. We're defeated. We're beat up and we're okay with it. We got no power. We're disciples. We call ourselves Christians, followers of Jesus, but we have no power. Jesus says, I did not make you to be a failure. I did not make you for defeat. I've called you to be a champion. I called you to conquer. I called you to overcome. I'm sending you my spirit. I'm giving you my power so that you can do that very thing. And the last thing that I believe that God has given to us, that Jesus has given to us to be sanctified as the people of God is the church. I believe in the church. I believe in the body of Christ. I believe that God has given us one to another as a gift. I, be I believe that God has given us one another that we might love each other, that we might encourage one another, not tear each other down. And I believe that if we were more unified and if we were more united and if we were more focused on praying and praying for ourselves and praying for the ones closest to us and praying for one another, we wouldn't get messed up in all these entanglements. We wouldn't get messed up in all these petty arguments and petty fights and, have, and give the world any reason to not want to be a part of the body of Christ. Sanctified. Cleansed. Committed. United. For a purpose. And then Jesus prays for those to come. As my dad said this morning, it's an eternal prayer, a perpetual prayer. It's like that book called The Giving Tree. It's the tree that keeps on giving, the tree of life, right? The tree of knowledge. It's the tree that you can never get enough of. It's the same thing. Jesus is right now sitting at the right-hand throne of the Father, and he's interceding. He's praying for you and for me right now. His prayer has not ended. He's praying for you right now. He's praying for your relationships. He's praying for your spiritual life. He's praying for your children. He's praying for your family. He's praying for the Gallegos family right now. He's praying for the whole Ochoa family right now that's going through that, that whole turbulent trial that they're going. Jesus is praying for them right now. Jesus is praying for the conflict or the potential conflict between the U.S. and Korea. Jesus is praying right now for all believers that people will come to know him. Jesus says, Father, now glorify me that I might glorify you. What's the purpose of it all? That we might win others to Jesus. That we might win others to God. That through our lives we might glorify God and who he's created us to be. Jesus, man. It's about following him. It's about following his example. Oh, if we thought, if we ever thought the prayers of our parents or even the prayers of our grandparents were powerful, we just stop to think about the prayers that Jesus is making on our behalf. If we just knew that and believed that and acted in that and on that, how would our lives change right now if we believed that? If we knew that Jesus was praying for us right now. I, before, every time before I ever took a test, I pray before I walked into that test. Before I stepped into the batter's box, I pray, God, help me right here, God. If we actually believe that God would, that Jesus was praying for us, around the clock, IHOP, International House of Prayer. You ever heard of IHOP? It's a 24-hour prayer cycle. And there's somebody in that room at all times praying, keeping the engine going. What if we had a prayer ministry, a prayer team here at church that prayed around the clock? What if we had people here on Sunday morning that prayed through all the services in a back room where we had a, a closet of prayer where people were praying for the lost souls? What if we had that?
Come talk to me if God puts that on your heart. We'll organize it. It's nothing like understanding that God, that God the Father has lent his ear to Jesus. We talk about the degrees of separation that Jesus began within that prayer all the way to us. Think about the spiritual DNA that's present there. That the spiritual DNA of Jesus is somehow mysteriously, spiritually weaved into who we are as believers. That we get to share in that. Come on, y'all. That we are grafted into who Jesus is in his very being. The last thing is this. We talk about Jesus. Talk about how he started this prayer off by praying for himself first. You know, we get on those uh, airplane rides and you got to listen to the, the hosts and hostesses give their whole spiel and open up all the cardboard handouts. And then they got these things that they grab down. They show you how to put the seatbelt in. And then they grab, grab this thing called an oxygen mask. And what do they always tell the people? Put this thing on, on your head first so that you can have the, the oxygen flow that you need to help all of those around you. Because we know that without it, we will run out of the supply of oxygen that we need to save others. And Jesus is saying, do as I have done. Cover yourself in prayer. Bathe yourself in prayer. Put on your spiritual oxygen mask first. Then begin to go and minister and love and encourage, and lift up, bring others to Jesus. Mm -hmm.